On this Debaco University video, I'm going to go over the importance of decarboxylation for cannabis. I'm going to go over a brief introduction of what this actually is uh, from a chemical standpoint, as well as go over a scientific study to give you some specifics that you can look for when going through this process. So here's the study, here's the research article. You can find the uh, screenshot of the first page right here, as well as the proper citation if you want to look at the study in more details. I'll provide you the brief overview here. So first off, starting with the very basics, is just what is decarboxylation? Well, all cannabinoids that are contained within the trichomes of raw cannabis flower consist of cannabinoids in their acidic form and have an extra carboxyl ring or group attached to the chain. And from a chemistry standpoint, that's a carbon with two oxygens and a hydrogen. The decarboxylation, or typically called decarbing, is where raw cannabis is heated so that the chemical structure of the acid cannabinoids changes to a neutral or non-acid form. It can also, if you notice right below me here, can also change in visual appearance. We're simply breaking off uh, that bond there through the process of heat. So the acidic to neutral form conversion, what's going on here? Well, this is when one states that the cannabinoids are in their acidic form, they're referring to the chemical structure of the compound itself. A cannabinoid that is in its acidic form has a carboxyl group attached, and the neutral forms will have the carboxyl group simply removed. So acid is the raw plant material, and the neutral form is a decarboxylated compound. And how does that look from a structure standpoint? Here we can see THCA and CBDA in their uh, acid form, or they're, how they'd be found on the raw plant material. When heat is added, we can see they both convert to their neutral form with the loss here of carbon dioxide. You can see that also pictured on this side as well, where we see the acidic forms are considered to be the inactive forms, and then through the deep carboxyl carb carboxylation process with heat and time, you get into the active forms or the neutral forms. Now the chemical structure changes, just to show that in a little bit more detail here. This transforming of the uh, cannabinoid acids into their neutral forms needs to simply remove that carboxyl group there. The weak bond holding the carboxyl group can be broken by a combination of heat as well as time. This describes the process of decarboxylation because you're removing their carboxyl group due to high temperature or combustion. The major difference chemically between the um, acid cannabinoids and their neutral counterparts is that extra um, bond there of that um, carboxyl group. So known as a carboxyl group, again, from a scientific chemistry standpoint, which consists of a carbon, oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen molecule cluster, and that's simply what's being broken off and removed, causing the conversion from the acidic form to that neutral form. It's also a loss of carbon dioxide in the process, as shown here. Now, why do we need to go through this process? Why is this even important? Um, why do we need to go through carboxylation, or de decarboxylation? This process essentially converts the chemicals to an active form by increasing the body's ability to absorb and bind the molecules. Essentially, the body can use the active form. Carboxylation happens naturally when the plant material is ignited. So through that heating process, through that combustion process, that is a natural way to add heat through time to convert the acidic form to that neutral form. So what's the importance of this process? You know, converting of THCA uh, uh, versus just regular THC. So while THCA is non-psychoactive, not uh, decarboxylated form. It's the precursor to THC, which is the which is the decarboxylated form. This does not uh, bind to the CB1 and CB2 receptors. Just note that THCA binds with other cannabinoid receptors in the endocannabinoid system. So that's why active is usually like in quotes. Although THCA uh, poses some therapeutic effects like anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective qualities, it is not the most beneficial, or it is, nor is it the psychoactive form. So we're not saying that THCA is you know, completely um, not able to be utilized by the body, but it doesn't seem like it's as utilized or as binds as well to the CB1 and CB2 receptors compared to its neutral form, THC. So what this requires, um, this decarboxylation does require heat and time. These are two main catalysts uh, to, uh, for this process to occur. Drying and curing cannabis over time will cause a partial decarboxylation to occur, but the heat and time will speed up that process and make it more efficient. 
Heating of the cannabinoids uh, to a lower temperature over time allows the cannabinoids to be decarboxylated while preserving the integrity of the material. Typically here we're talking about terpenes. This is used so that it can be incorporated into what is ultimately going to be consumed. And you see this kind of like conversion here. We notice that THCA is decreasing, at the same time THC would be increasing. So here's that general like conversion graph. It's kind of I have the picture of the seesaw here. It's kind of that like inverse relationship here, and this shows the theoretical conversion of the acidic forms of THC and CBD uh, to the neutral forms. Notice the inverse relationship as the amounts change. At the end, THC and CBD remain in high concentrations. So what's basically happening here? Here, this line is representing THCA, and you see when that starts to drop and go down, the presence or concentration of THC increases. And the same thing can be applied to CBDA and CBD. There's that inverse relationship. One's being converted to another, so that's why you're getting kind of that seesaw-like uh, conversion. Now, test results before and after decarboxylation. Cannabis flowers are often tested for both THC as well as THCA. Note that THC is often found in small percentages in fresh flour because it has not gone through the heat and the time to decarboxylate it. And we could see here, here's THC and here's THCA. We can see after uh, that decarboxylation process, we can see that conversion here is a lot more THC compared to THCA. So it's just important note there, and a lot of times labs do test for both even in uh, regular dry flour, so that a grower can have an understanding as well as a consumer of that potential conversion to the amount of desirable cannabinoid. Now, the best what's the best decarboxylation temperature for CBD? And it's, again, we're going to look at CBD as well as THC. So there is some dispute over the exact decarboxylation temperature for CBD. According to studies, however, it appears to be approximately 203 degrees Fahrenheit or 110 degrees Celsius. Uh, as for the time frame, neither THC nor CBD will decarboxylate instantaneously at their precise decarb temperature. So it's not like you hit that temperature and you get that automatic conversion. There is still a time factor to take into consideration. A longer period, typically between 40 and 60 minutes, will be required for that carboxyl group to break down into water and carbon dioxide. So it's a little bit of a range there to give you a general idea, but it's not like instantaneous you hit that temperature and 100% converts. There needs to be a duration of time. Uh, also considered. Now, don't get decarboxylation temperatures confused with boiling points because they are not the same. Now, boiling points for cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids have been much more thoroughly studied than decarboxylation temperatures. Boiling points for the compounds are all provided here in Fahrenheit and Celsius. And here's kind of um, more of a pictorial graph here, um, giving you some, some more information. But this is what was provided in the study. These boiling points are not the same as decarboxylation temperatures. A little bit easier to study, a little bit more public but you have to be aware of what number you're looking at, what that correlates with. Because you want to avoid high temperatures. It's important to keep a tight temperature control, applying cannabis to various technological applications. While heat is needed to decarboxylate the acids into the active form of cannabinoids, our bodies can use extreme temperatures can destroy many of these important plant materials that contribute to positive health outcomes such as terpenes. If cannabis is heated above 300 degrees Fahrenheit, you need, to run, you need to run the risk of denaturing many important other plant compounds. So it's not just the concept of more heat is better. There we have to be careful with that. Because there's also compounds that will volatilize uh, and evaporate at higher temperatures. And this can result in an unpleasant odor as well as an unpleasant haste. So too much heat, too much is just going to cause a degradation of that product. So you simply want to use the minimum temperature, basically, to try to preserve those terpenes. It is advisable to keep the decarboxylation temperatures at a low point to preserve terpenes as well as other compounds. Each individual terpene may have its own therapeutic benefits, so, but this also carries its own sensitivity to heat. If terpenes are to be stored, the temperature in the range of 200-300 degrees Fahrenheit uh, should be maintained there. We're not looking at you know heating up too high, start getting above certain uh, theoretical temperatures and they will break down and we don't want to lose those terpenes that we've spent so much time in the plant growing breaking those down. Now maintaining consistent temperature is important so for this process a digital uh, oven a safe thermometer is recommended so that the temperature that works best for the final product can be continually monitored. Note, if you're using an oven, limit the number of times you open the door uh, during the decarboxylation process, so this will cause temperature fluctuations and will reduce consistency and total yield of the decarboxylation process. 
If you're looking at a graph of the temperatures, you don't want to have these that have these like large swings in it. You want to have very minimal noise, data noise. You want to have a graph that looks more like this because that will ensure a more consistent temperature and a more consistent repeatable process. Now, speeding up the process is what a lot of people want to do, kind of we see here, but just as if you drive too fast, that can have negative effects. Now, the key to faster decarboxylation is known to be greater heat, and this should be a clear process. Unfortunately, it's not easy. Also, speeding up the process can result in a reduction of the quality of the end product, and we don't want to kind of avoid, we want to avoid that. Now, cannabis trim. Uh, trim is what is removed from the final flower after harvest. Trim includes sugar leaves, bits of cut-off buds, and knocked off trichomes or keef. This portion of the plant is considered low quality and is usually reserved for making edibles, hash, pre-rolls, or simply just used for extraction. And the reason why I mention this and define this is we're going to see this study uh, uses these terms, so I want you to understand what this plant material it's referring to. Now going to the other portion here, the keef explained. Uh, when trichomes dry and break off the plant, becomes this keef product, which is kind of what it looks like. It's a popular byproduct uh, of weed consumption and is often used for edible creations. Keef is, has oxidized and lost its freshness when separated from the plant buds, it usually has a darker color than uh, trichomes, ranging from a light gold to kind of a brown coloration, kind of the rendition you see here in this image. It has a powdery appearance and a texture that is somewhat sticky, often less so than trichomes on the actual bud. Keef tends to decarb faster than an intact flower, so keep that in mind when we're looking at the temperatures and suggestions for the decarboxylation process. So here's the temperature in uh, times chart. So suggested times for different temperatures are provided for the type of cannabinoid, either THC or CBD, and the material being decarboxylated. Is it flour or is it keef? And we can see here the temperature um, ranges here, the heating mode, the plant material time for high THC and high CBD, uh, keef or hash time, and then cannabis oil time is all uh, provided here. So you can see how there are fluctuations in time based on temperature. They really didn't do a lot here um, with this one with the hot oil bath, focus more on the oven, and they used a boiling water bath um, as well here with the suggested times below. You know, here's a link. You can definitely pause the video or search the primary source as well. Now, THC content does change over time uh, exposed to different temperatures. So the highest concentration of THC, which in this case was about 15 um, milligrams uh, per gram, is obtained when the material is decarboxylated at 122 degrees Celsius for 27 minutes. So we kind of see the graph uh, provided here. Uh, and we're looking at kind of this, this one right here being kind of the ideal for 27 minutes. It's kind of lining up right here. And you'll notice, again, it doesn't happen instantaneously. It does start to break down and then it kind of peaks out and tapers off kind of plateaus. We don't want to run it for too long because we could get a degradation at that point. So that 20 to 27 minutes, 27 minutes being suggested by the data presented here. Now changes in content here. Uh, in at least in percentage of the main cannabinoids before and after the decarboxylation process. Now here's the cannabinoids, THCA and THC, the acidic form, the neutral form, CBDA and CBD, CBN, and then the moisture and the total cannabinoids. And we're seeing before decarboxylation, the content again in percentages. And we can notice that THCA um, quite high. And then we see THC being relatively low. 30 minutes of decarboxylation compared to 60 minutes, we can see that THCA almost degrades to nothing, which as we expect, and it's being converted because it's simply being converted to THC. And we see the same pattern here for CBDA being converted to CBD, and then CBN, and then a moisture there. Now it's important just to remember that the acidic forms are being converted to their biologically active neutral forms during this process. Note that the longer, 60 minutes in this case, basically right below me, time caused a reduction in total cannabinoids. We see that highlighted right here. We peaked here at 30 minutes at the 30.3, and went down to 27.4. So the content of CBDA before decarboxylation was 0.6, and an hour after decarboxylation decreased to 0.3. And we can see that here. Whereas the CBD content before was 0%, we see that right here, and after 30 minutes was increased to 1%. So again, we're seeing that time, we're seeing that conversion uh, process because of the heat and the time from the acidic form to that neutral form. Now, I just want you to leave you, I didn't want to just leave you with that. I want you to understand that there's other factors of variability. This isn't just a necessarily a set, cut, and dry chemical process. 
the variety of the cannabis being used, the age or freshness of the product, the equipment being used, and the flower uniformity all play a role in this decarboxylation process. So the variety of cannabis being used, let's just touch on that uh, here for a moment. I'm going to go into each of these in a little bit more detail. Each type of cannabis contains different amounts of ratios of different cannabinoids and terpenes, which impact the optimum decarboxylation time as well as the temperature. This can also be impacted by the physical structure of the flower, so take that into consideration. Since each cannabinoid and terpene decarboxylates at different temperatures, knowing what the plant naturally contains will impact the temperature protocol that should be implemented. You now you're focusing on a type 1, a type 2, a type 3, what specific terpenes might be of high presence in your particular cultivar or variety being used. Also, age and freshness of the product. There will be a noticeable differences in the final product depending on the age or freshness of the material you start with. This really impacts the amount of degradation that may occur before decarboxylation. Remember, the decarboxylation process only converts the acidic form from the uh, form to the bioactive neutral form. It does not create CBD or create the THC molecule. It's a conversion. You're taking that A and you're breaking that carboxyl group off. That's what you're left with. This is not a creation of a molecule. It's a conversion of a molecule. Now, also the equipment being used, and this could be a high source of variability because you want to reduce that variability. And the ability to maintain a precise temperature will have a direct impact on the total yield. Continually monitoring the temperature is also important. In oven or other systems, such as a cooker, or slow cooker, or instant cooker is used, there will be a small variability in the cooking equipment that may affect the final product and may also affect the repeatability of your protocol. This is why uh, equipment intended for this purpose is recommended, such as a decarboxylation uh, jacketed glass reactor or other professional oven. They're going to have l more repeatability, they're going to have less variability, but you are going to pay more for them. And flower uniformity. So this is another factor to take into consideration, as this can refer to the size, but also the density of the final flower. The greater the consistency of the size and density will allow for the most consistent decarboxylation process. As an extreme example, a fine cannabis or powdered keef will require a much shorter cooking time to prevent burning and denaturing of the important compounds in the plant compared to an intact flower. If the flower consistency uh, varies widely, um, then grinding up the plant material will help increase the uniformity of the decarboxylation process, or doing runs or batches of flowers with the same uniformity will help increase your ability to have this repeatable and consistent um, end result. Now, just some general key points. Never um, just keep in mind that you need to have uh, higher temperatures. Um, at, I'm sorry, at higher temperatures, keef and hash tend to decarboxylate faster than dried flowers, simply because of the surface area. You have more surface area all ground up there, going to have a greater chance of that heat penetration. High CBD strains tend to have uh, tend to decarboxylate a bit slower than those with high THC content. So just having that, knowing what the, you're expecting from your compounds can help you plan for that in the um, protocol process. Three main factors with any decarboxylation. It's important uh, parameters to perform a good decarboxylation are the time or duration, the temperature what you keep um, the um, oven or heating device at, and the quality of decarboxylation equipment for consistency as well as repeatability. So lastly, if you just want the basic suggestions here, if you've made it this far into the video, uh, suggestions for decarboxylation in your own cannabis. From the review of the published uh, literature, highest concentration of THC, which is about 15 milligrams per gram, is obtained when the material is decarboxylated at 122 degrees Celsius for 27 minutes. Now, if you're looking at converting CBDA to CBD, a higher temperature is required, about 150 degrees Celsius, and a suggested time for about 30 minutes. If you're looking at decarboxylating uh, kefir hash in an oven, uh, bake it for about 10 minutes at 300 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 149 degrees um, Celsius there for consistency. Hopefully this gives you a general idea of a really good starting point, as well as other factors to consider that you may not have originally thought of to ensure you're getting the most uh, quality end product from your starting material. But if you don't have a good grow or good uh, protocols to begin with, and you don't have good flour, uh, this will do the best it can, but keep in mind you need to have it in the plant to be able to decarboxylate it to get that final end product result that you desire.